Hello, and welcome to the Dr. Joseph Warren Historical Society interview series with prominent authors and historians specializing in the colonial period in revolutionary America. My name is Randy Flood, and today I'm joined by my colleague, Christian Despigna, author of Founding Modern, The Life and Death of Dr. Joseph Warren, the American Revolution's Lost Hero. This presentation is brought to you in cooperation with the Real American Revolution and the American Revolution Consortium for Civic Education. Now, our guest today is Bruce Franklin, founder of West Home Publishing in 2003, with just a single title to start out with. In the ensuing years, he's grown West Home to a catalog of more than 300 titles. In 2017, West Home acquired the Journal of the American Revolution. Since then, the journal has tripled its subscription base and has launched the podcast Dispatches. Now, Bruce began his publishing career at the University of Chicago Press and subsequently worked for the University of Pennsylvania Press before founding West Home. So Bruce, welcome to the show. We're delighted to have you with us. And Christian, let's go with the first question. Bruce, thanks for coming on. We really sure. appreciate your time. Let's, let's start off with the basics. So I'm curious, and I've never asked you this in all the times we've met, but how was West Home Publishing founded and, and why the focus on history, particularly early American history? Well, I, I worked, as uh, uh, your colleague said, at Chicago and Penn, and there I started in, in production. So I learned how the books were made, and then I moved into marketing and then to acquisitions. So I was always interested in, in publishing, and I thought, hey, uh, I'd like to start a press. Well, I was thinking about that. I actually went and bought a thousand ISBNs before, before, before having a single book. <laughs> well, then uh, Seabiscuit, that movie was coming out. And my wife said, hey, uh, you should read the Hillebrand book before you see the movie. You, know, you always want to read the book before the movie. And I said, sure, I will. Well, I remember that at a flea market a couple of years before, I got an old book on Seabiscuit. And so I went to Hillebrand's book and the first footnote was to this book called by Beckwith called Saga of a Great Champion, Seabiscuit. Well, I went to our closet where we had it and I folded it out and uh, I looked on the internet and there was no copies available completely forgotten book. So I you know, wrote the copyright office, it was in public domain. So I told uh, Laura, my wife, I said, well, I'm gonna print this, reprint this, I'll be a fool not to. And uh, so I did reprint it. There was a big Publishers Weekly article, um, Barnes and Noble supported it, Amazon, we did, we fulfilled it right out of the house. And from that uh, point, it capitalized the company. And then I began to acquire things that I'd really been anticipating acquiring, including a history of the longbow by of all people, Hugh Soar, a, a British guy. And I also can say it's probably the only book, maybe the last book that was done completely through fax because <laughs> he, he had to go to a library <laughs> where he was in England and we'd fax his correspondence <laughs> back and forth. But anyway, after that, I had commissioned Glenn Williams to write Year of the Hangman. Mm -hmm. And The Crooked Stick, actually, the very first book I did that first season got a rave Wall Street Journal review. So I did Seabiscuit, and then the crooked stick on Longbow, and then came Glenn's book. And Glenn's book also got a rave Wall Street Journal review. So that basically, and also I must say, uh, Sally Leventhal, who buys history at Barnes and Noble for many years, always a big supporter. She actually believed in what I was doing. And so she was, she was very important in the early part of the press, as was Eric Eichmann at the Wall Street Journal, who also said, hey, this is really cool. But anyway, regarding history, here I am, um, I'm a stone's throw from Trenton, New Jersey, just south of Washington Crossing, that's where we are. And there were so few books on the American Revolution at the time when I started, particularly for our area. And I thought, wow, you know, what a, what a, a fertile you know, period of history. Because at that time, you imagine there were so many Civil War books, uh, Civil World War II, that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. So I, I started you know, exploring. And it really was Glenn's book then led to other ones. And ultimately, uh, Todd Anderlich uh, mm -hmm. came from the Journal of American Revolution and said, hey, I have an idea. I'd really like to do annual volumes. So we worked out that and I started doing the annual volumes. And then he subsequently came to me and said he needed an exit strategy, basically. He couldn't do it. And I was delighted to, uh, to help out and uh, keep JAR going. Yeah, That's awesome. And, That's and, awesome. You know, I'd like to add, you know, a lot of your books that have been uh, published got rave Wall Street Journal reviews, not just... Oh yeah. So, yeah, yeah. In fact, uh, this one right here by Don Hagist. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Just right. Yeah. Right around Thanksgiving, this got a. I mean, a terrific review. 
Yeah, and, and Don, uh, uh, he's a great guy. He really oh, yeah. is. Absolutely. Yeah. And he's been given talks. I noticed he's been given a lot of talks on that book, a lot of virtual talks. Okay. Yeah, exactly. That's what you can do. It, it's 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 a, a problem as far as it's sad that uh, bookstores aren't operating like they have to or are used to, and other <clears throat> associations can't have their meetings and things like that. But this whole virtual platform is actually uh, uh, expanded, I think, a lot of these kind of small talks and information and things like that. And frankly, it's allowed authors to go places they couldn't normally go. Right. Absolutely. Well, Bruce, what do you look for in a project when you're considering publication? Um, it's interesting. I, I think you can tell a project almost immediately. So something that comes across my desk, I can tell. And uh, for instance, there is a biography of Rebecca Nurse, who was the woman in the Salem witch trials, who was actually convicted and then and then uh, killed, uh, executed, and then later on she was uh, uh, vindicated. And so I had done earlier a book, uh, I have it here called "In the Shadow of Salem," and that's uh, 1692, and that's the uh, witchcraft in Andover, which is actually a larger one. And I did that again because. Uh, going back to another one, King William's War, okay? And King William's War, this came across my desk and it's like, okay, King William's War, no one's done something like this in a long time. It's a perfect, you know, sort of uh, setup for uh, even the American Revolution studies, you know, because this was actually the first French and British war for North America. So he came to me with this, so I did this. So then you get the, the Salem book comes and I, I, I know people were interested in this kind of uh, topic that did very well. So then when this nurse biography comes to me, I, I look at it and then, okay, I like the topic. Next thing is sort of, okay, you know, how long it is. You know, sometimes you have books, projects that are like, I got one, I think on like, I don't know, Confederate Minds or whatever, it was like 400,000 words. It was like, you know, I mean, there's so many that's interested in it, but that's a big book. Um, so I look at that and then I, and then I definitely look at the, the writing um, because I, I tell authors, one of the first things I like to do is I like to imagine a book being in a bookstore. So I want books, and I, I think that uh, a lot of people comment that our books are good looking, and that's important. I've, I've had a single designer the whole time. Uh, Trudy Gershenoff has been with me since the get-go. So one person does the work for me. She has a great look. So I think that's important. And the next thing is, if you pick up a book, you open it up, what is it, what's like the first page say? You know, what, what is it, you know, what, what is this saying? And so uh, that's how I approach a manuscript. So mm -hmm. it's sort of, a, basically it's a topic, and then uh, is it feasible, you know, uh, mm -hmm. and then, you know, how does it read? And regarding feasibility, um, there is a book that I did that actually got a choice academic uh, uh, book of the year for, for history. It was actually a Civil War title. Now, the thing about this book is it was about, it was called To Raise Up a Nation. And it was about the history of African-Americans and their slow uh, emancipation and uh, ability to fight in the Civil War. The book was massive though. I mean, it was big, but the writing was so compelling. And I figured, hey, this is just so good. So I sent it to a couple of people I trusted. They said, wow, this really is something special. Turns out this guy is a truck driver in New Jersey <laughs> who did all his work by, by uh, going to the New York Public Library, taking out books in a library alone, reading them, and then getting on the road for long distance training and just thinking about it. And he spent years and years doing this. Wow. So I told him when he got the award, I said, I, you know, there are people out there they're looking for, for a tenure and you know, this and that, they would love to have a choice that can have a record. And here you're on a big rig delivering supplies for some bridge in Washington, DC. You know, he got a big chuckle out of that. But that's an example where it was such a good book the length didn't bother me, you know, that, that's, you know, cause in publishing it is, you know, you have to be pragmatic, you know, you have to mm -hmm. you know, figure out how to make things cost effective. Mm -hmm. right. Awesome. Thank you. You know, and, and to pick up on that a little bit, you really are putting out solid books written by um, scholars, historian, researchers, truck drivers, yeah. and you have hundreds of titles. So, you, but the thing I think is you're offering readers, not only books about major historical events and big name biographies, but, but often really more obscure aspects of early American history and that might never have found a home with other publishing houses. And, and I really think that's one of Wes Holmes' major strengths. So I, I kind of wanted to ask, you know, how do you scout for new authors and titles? I mean, is it mostly you're getting submissions and, and blind queries or is, what makes up for the lion's shares of how you get new authors? Um, one thing which is, is fascinating, and thank you for the kind words, um, is that 
most of my authors, you know, come back to me with new books. I mean, they, they like working with me. You know, it's the kind of thing, because it's also, it's realistic. I've been in the business for a long time. I know how bookstores operate. I know, you know, all this kind of stuff. And it's important for authors to, to understand that what I'm trying to do is to bring their message out to readers. I mean, I'm not a rich guy. Believe me, I'm not making a ton of money doing this kind of thing. You know what I mean? A lot of authors point, have to realize, right? you, know, you know what I mean? It's like, but, but I love doing it. So I, 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 I get enough to keep it going. And as far as authors, so I do have repeat authors. Um, I do have many that will come to me because they <clears throat> see my books in stores, frankly. And uh, I do tell a lot of authors who are looking for publishers that might not be my, you know, my uh, 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 editorial area. I say, go to a store and look at the publishers that are publishing books like yours and approach them. Um, so yeah, I get, I get blind submissions that way. I do commission some books, um, but I do think that uh, after 17 years, West Holm, as you say, has gotten enough of a reputation that you can come and, and uh, bring your book to me and you know, it'll, it'll, the job will get very well done. Uh, the book will get out there. We'll try to get it reviewed and things like that. Um, but what, what we all know is that subjects, particularly the, like you say, some of these sort of niche subjects, there's an audience. There are people that do like this. And uh, so you know, I, I look for that. Again, there are many topics which are just too narrow for any publisher mm -hmm. really to do. But I, but I do, I don't shy away from things that I think like, yeah, I think that there are eight, 900,000 people that really enjoy this story. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, Bruce, let's talk about the, the, those individuals. Uh, what does the publishing landscape look like today specifically? And do you think that COVID has increased or maybe de decreased book sales overall? Well, Publishers Weekly does report that book sales are robust, and I'm seeing it. Um, uh, it's actually been a boon for ebooks. And the, the fascinating thing about ebooks is that initially, uh, when they came on board, remember Amazon was really pushing them, so it was like Kindle, mm -hmm. and that every you know folks they right. want two ninety nine or whatever, ninety nine cents. But what what I found is that the ebook allowed older readers and people with uh, eyesight problems to actually enjoy and re-engage in reading because you can actually change the font size and things like that on an e-reader. So rather than it, the print books actually sales going down, it was more like, hey, there's a new audience. So in this time of COVID, mm -hmm. um, I do think there are people that are returning to uh, the joy of reading. Uh, and, and, and I think there are a lot of people who are, are exploring for the first time things like ebooks. And uh, um, I think that, you know, getting books out of the public library, even uh, mm -hmm. audiobooks are mm -hmm. also popular. And uh, I do have a, a, a company, Red Book Audio, that does do most of my books now. And so it's a really nice partnership mm -hmm. uh, because that's another area. I mean, I listen to audiobooks. I love to. You know, with an audiobook, the great thing about that, which you guys might are the same way. It's like, I'd like to read everything, but I only have time to read so much. But if I'm driving in a car or whatever, I'm doing something like that, I'll right. find an audio right. book. So I'm reading that book in a sense, but uh, That's right. Right. Yeah, that kind of thing. So yeah, yeah. although, so I, I think it's actually, it's it hasn't been bad for publishing at all, overall. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks. Yeah. yeah. Well, let's switch to Journal of the American Revolution now. Sure. What is the JAR mission and, and what makes the Journal of the American Revolution a special publication? Um. Yeah, Journal of the American Revolution is, is I mean, it's a, it's a, a fascinating uh, and I think an important uh, place, website, um, because there are not many places which have the sort of the level of professionalism uh, and also specificity uh, of topic that the Journal of the American Revolution has. I mean, it's, uh, uh, it's a really um, dedicated audience. Um, we get people subscribing all the time, and we have people obviously that don't subscribe but just visit the website and read things. So I think the mission, and I've carried it from the from the first, you know, the founders, is the idea to continue to uh, discuss, promote, explore, uh, research uh, this period of history from, you know, basically uh, let's say the 1760s and earlier, all the way to let's say the 1810s. Um, and I'm actually. Uh, just not surprised. It's I think it's more heartened by the quality and number of persons that come forward to say, "Hey, I'd like to contribute a, an article to this journal," and they and they range from as you know uh, from retired persons, specialists that might be in the aerospace industry or something, and then uh, you know young scholars. It's really nice to see you know kids even in, in late high school, an AP student that did an article for us, but also uh, persons working on their PhDs and things like that. 
And you, 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 what, what's important is that, and I see it now in more and more books that are published, not by Westholm, but in general, references to jar articles. And the thing about this, because uh, the Journal of American Revolution provides an opportunity for these very small, a lot of times, uh, well-researched uh, topics to be published and for free access. So someone is doing some, let's say they're doing some research on uh, espionage in Georgia or something. They all of a sudden, boom, up comes this article written in the Journal of American Revolution with sources and, and you know, naming names. And, and you know, it's like, wow, this is really, somebody has helped me in my research. They've done some work. And the other side are genealogists, people that love to, to explore their family heritage. And again, there are many, many people uh, who will you know, search and up will come a JAR article and they'll be talking about you know, some family uh, in South Carolina or something or some family in Vermont and, and they'll say, hey, wow, that's my uh, whatever, whatever relative kind of thing. So it's, it's a, it, that's that side. Another side is, and this is one area where I, I really want to, to, to move forward even more, are the K through 12 uh, educators, because we do get uh, responses and, and teachers telling us that, hey, like for instance, top 10 facts about Hessians was really useful to their class, you know, or, or there's an article that we did on, the, on the crossing the Delaware. These articles are accessible, you know, and usable by teachers in their classes. So I really like that. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, Don and I have, have often discussed ways to reach out and make the site uh, fulfill some of that part of the mission, the idea of public education. And so, you know, that's, that's Excellent. the mission basically. Excellent. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you're talking about the publishing landscape and we know the political landscape is kind of crazy nowadays and really like e even patriotism can be a, a loaded term these days. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask, you know, what steps is JAR taking to a more inclusive approach, studying and highlighting the role of women, African Americans, and minority groups in early American history? Um, yeah, it, it, it's a good question, uh, Christian. And to, to begin, uh, our site gets, you know, literally, you know, a million and a half, two million visitors a year, okay? And we have, you know, thousands of subscribers, this kind of thing. Can I tell you, ever since, I've uh, operated JAR. There's been almost no negative comments ever posted because the comments come through us first. So we get to sort of review comments uh, until you're like, say, okay. <laughs> and then your comments, I, I may just go, you know, get fed. But see, you're a new commenter, commenter. It's the kind of thing where we look at it and see if it's actually a contribution to the article and whatever. And we say, okay, let it rip. I actually had thought that we'd get lots of spam, uh, particularly during the political. Yeah. Uh, season, you know, I thought, right. man, you know, I could not even imagine, you know, but really so little, which is, again, it's really kind of cool because it's not that we have a, a small audience. We actually have a pretty wide audience. And yet right. I think that people are very, the tone is respectful, I guess I should say. So uh, regarding expanding that way, um, we have a series of articles. I think uh, some readers have noticed that we're doing, uh, uh, focusing on, on African-Americans that contribute to the American Revolution this month. And again, um, Don reached out to contributors and we have several that, you know, you know, did a great job, very kind of them to pr produce these uh, small vignettes and other little uh, aspects of African-American contribution. Um, and we're always looking, I mean, anybody, you know, it's the kind of thing that people who write articles for us, they approach us with email. We don't know who they are necessarily, whether they're white, black, you know, whatever, you know. Um, oh, yeah. But so it's the kind of thing where um, we want to be as inclusive as possible and uh, I think over time, um, more and more people are comfortable with the environment we have at JAR. Because as you say, sometimes people associate patriotism. I think mean, one thing that, every, that always gets me in a certain way, and again, I'm a pretty laid back guy, so not anything bother me, but one thing I try to get sort of ironic are the people that use that don't tread on me flag as some sort of symbol, sort of like, you know, separation or something, or like, you know, don't tread on me. It's like, Hey guys, it was meant for unification. You know that it's become right. something powerful when it's unified. Yeah. It's not a disunion flag. You know that kind right, of thing. Right, right. Um, so wow. I think though that a lot of people do associate that kind of element with early American history. You know, white Protestant, all that kind of stuff. And so I think as time has gone by, more people are realizing, you know, yeah, no, this is talking about and is not afraid to talk about all issues. You know, uh, you know that occurred in the period. Also, our, our latest JAR book award nominee uh, wrote the Boston Massacre. And uh, her book, she's a, a professor at Carleton. She was thrilled 
And uh, what I thought was really cool is that she was already very familiar with JAR and, and felt like it was such a great honor and a great sight. So I thought that's, that's cool. A professional historian that really uh, gives us some accolades and was very happy with what had mm -hmm. occurred. Awesome, yeah. awesome. Well, Bruce is a final question. Let's look in the crystal ball here. What plans are in the works for the Journal of the American Revolution in the future? Well, we are working on a video series. And this goes back to our sort of like K-12 uh, uh, initiative. And we're having contributors. And it's interesting, we've done one so far. I'll talk to Don, I'm not sure when we'll launch this thing, you know, you know officially. But we have one that's in the, in the can, if you will, on Loyalists. And it, this is COVID film. So these are guys talking, I guess they might be using iPhones or something like that and, uh, in their you know, living rooms or whatever. But the whole idea is to have these to be short. So they're like, you know, three minutes, whatever, sort of a YouTube-ish kind of thing. And we're going to do just things that we'll do, we will do, like women, African-Americans, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Native Americans, you know, loyalists. Uh, we'll just do, you know, the Stamp Act, you know, things like that. So the whole idea will be to have these short uh, uh, videos that people can then use to, uh, uh, you know, however they want to use them, just watch them for fun or use them in a classroom, anything like that. So that's one of the initiatives we're doing. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Christian. Yeah. And, uh, keep up the good work. I mean, we really, uh, we're admiring what you're doing over there and it's, uh, inspiring. So yeah, thank thanks you, for joining us today, Bruce. It's, it really ha has been a pleasure having you on. And to our listeners, we've been talking with Bruce Franklin, publisher of West Home Publishing, Join us again next time and remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel on behalf of my colleague, Randy Flood and myself. This is Christian Despina saying so long for now. Thank you. Thank you very much.